So, officially welcome to the National Museum, Palace of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania. My name is Laura, I'm an archaeologist and a guide in this museum, and today I'll be your virtual guide. So, if you will take a look around, you will notice that the palace itself is actually completely new. It was only opened in 2013. However, what it is protecting is very far away from new. For example, if you look to that side, we will notice remains of the old castle uh, brick kind of brick building. Uh, the reason why this specific wall is so important is because before the palace gets even established where we are, already had a beautiful city in place that included lower castle territories. This specific wall is actually the oldest surviving brick castle remains in Lithuania dated the end of 13th century and the beginning of 14th. What is interesting the castle didn't just have defensive walls it also had a beautiful building within the complex that the remains of we can actually see. It's believed that this specific building could have been used for the residential purposes. Now, today during the tour, we'll visit four different routes the museum currently has. The first route is more about archaeology, meaning the authentic stuff that was found within the perimeter of the palace. The second route would be historical interiors, recreated to showcase how the palace looked when it was still functioning. The third one is basically going back to the archaeology, showcasing the original Gediminas Tower, and three different themes weapons, everyday life with kitchen, and musing. And the fourth route is actually the most ever-changing route because in that specific one, we see different international or not international exhibitions that visit our palace every few years. Now, without any further ado, let's move on to the first route. So welcome to the first route of our National Museum. This specific route is special because it showcases the original ruins of the palace, the previous castles, and most of the items that we have found through archaeological research. Now, this route is different compared to the second one that we'll see a bit later because everything is authentic, from this territory, while everything on the second route, even though most of it is authentic, had to be purchased and brought into the palace. Now we are in the cellars of former palace, meaning the underground level. Even now, even now currently Vilnius is a bit higher compared to previously. What is interesting, if you will look to that side, you will notice we have beautiful vaults already starting from this point, and they would go right above this whole area. The current palace is a bit wider compared to the previous one, because we did have to protect the original ruins. Hence why, take a notice, our current palace is basically situated above the ruins, almost like hugging it and rising above, showcasing the connection to current times. Now let's go a bit lower to actually see the buildings that once existed, but sadly during the times were either destroyed or can no longer be seen. On the way, you can take a look at the actual walls. You will notice a lot of them look like mixture. It's because the castle was here before the palace, a lot of walls were doubled through times. Here is the depiction that I mentioned before. Vilnius city has been researched quite well, so we know fairly well what specific architectural pieces existed. Everything that you can see in white has been found through archaeological research and was obviously mentioned in historical records. Everything in color managed to survive or was partially or fully rebuilt. That includes obviously our palace, cathedral, cathedral tower, the upper castle, and other national museum. Now you will notice the landscape looks different as well. The whole area is surrounded by River Vilnale. Currently, this part of Vilnale no longer exists. It was actually almost fully removed in the 18th century. However, this Vilnale is one of the reasons why the palace was established here and why castles were established here. However, before talking about the palace or the castles, we have to remember the place itself had much deeper history. For example, the oldest items in our collection are dated 6,000 years before Christ, meaning Stone Age. Some are dated to Bronze Age and also leading up to the castle periods, meaning 13th century, 14th century, and obviously palace 16th, 17th, and 18th. 
So the next part showcases the items that were found during excavations. Most of them are wooden items predating the palace itself. And what do you think is the start of any good city has to have? It's plumbing. On this side, on, and on that side, we have plumbing remains. On this side, we have pipes that led into the castle and later on into the palace, allowing clean, drinkable water to arrive. On the opposite side, we have a sewage gutter that allowed dirty water leave palace's territory, creating more or less clean environment. When I say clean, I don't mean in our current standards. Obviously, cleanliness was seen differently. And here we can see a well. Now, this well specifically is over 500 years old. Obviously, time has left the mark, hence why we have spaces now between different planks. But at that time, we know at least nine wells were existent in the palace's territory. However, because groundwater level was kind of polluted by city citizens, most of this water wouldn't be used for daily things like food cooking and so on, but rather to clean or upkeep with beautiful gardens that were surrounding the palace. Now, going back to sewage gutter, it's actually a very interesting piece because it's the biggest wooden item in Lithuania currently that was well, basically restored and conservated using sugar solution. It had to lay in it for a couple of years, and now we have the dirtiest item in our collection to be the sweetest. Now, let's go to the third area. This area sadly depicts the time when the palace was attacked and partially destroyed. Palace being main political building was obviously the target for the enemy attacks. First major attack happens in the middle of 17th century. Moscow army manages to overtake the place. Vilnius soldiers sadly were not here to protect it. They will control it for almost six years. And after six years, our own military forces will finally push them out. However, one of the rooms, we believe this specific area, contained gunpowder. It explodes, destroying one corner of the palace, destroying some of the outside walls, and starting a huge fire, hence why all of the black bricks. And even though this was a huge hit, the palace wasn't completely destroyed. It remained standing, sadly, no longer in a good condition to be used as a residence. It will remain like this for almost 50 years, until 18th century comes around and decision is reached. Palace will be given to city citizens to use it as they wish. So basically they will establish their apartments here. For almost 100 years, that's how palace will continue functioning. However, now 19th century will come around. This time Russian imperial administration will take over. Their decision will be to destroy this building. Why? Even though it wasn't pretty, it wasn't used as a residence for quite some time, it was very important historically building that still had a lot of political pow power. So they ordered Schlossburgers, local um, very wealthy tradesmen, to organize a destruction. All floors get demolished, except for the one that we're in, which is the cellar level. All bricks of the outside walls are sold off, and everything that is of value obviously is taken away. Everything else is buried underneath the ground and Schlossberger's house is built on top of it to almost cover whatever existed here before. And only once Lithuania will reach independence or close to independence, we'll start doing in-depth research. After 30 years of archaeological, historical and other types of research, we'll recover enough information to not only kind of retrieve back our history, but to also establish this museum. Overall, in our funds, we have at least half a million archaeological artifacts. Now, talking about artifacts, let's go beyond the wall to see some of them. So now we are physically behind the palace wall that you can actually see right here on the right from me and to the left from you. And this is also the place where we talk about the earlier periods of the territory itself and obviously the castles. So at the very beginning, when you just entered the museum, I showed you the brick castle remains that are dated the end of 13th century. Here we have the picture of how that castle looked. This castle was not only important because, like I said, the remains of which, which is this specific wall, 
and this specific building managed to survive until our days, but it also had influence on the development of the whole territory. Interestingly enough, the upper castle at that time is still made of wood, only later on it will be replaced by the brick one. And this is also the time when Gediminas dynasty, well, early Gediminas dynasty is already in place. Take a nice look as well. Cathedral that now is a huge building that we love actually at that time is still quite small and is protected by just a simple wooden wall. And obviously, once again, River Vilnala is surrounding the whole area, keeping it safe from the attackers. Now, because during research we found more items correlating to Lithuania's past overall, let me show you items from Stone Age. A lot of them are actually dated 6,000 years before Christ. Some came from bronze, meaning 4,000 years before Christ. So if you look right here, you can see the earliest findings. We have stone tools that once again are dated around 6,000 years before Christ, flint items that have markings of being used or at least made into uh, future tools. On the lower part, we can see Bronze Age items that already includes jewelry that sometimes can be connected to Roman Empire, not because they were here, but because we had trade routes. Between this part of exhibition and the next one, we have this one. All of these items actually remind us about our former religion, paganism. It's believed that all those are pagan ritualistic staffs, the heads looking like poppies, probably were used during ceremonies to pray to a specific god to have a better yield. Items next to it are connected to trade routes, so most of these items were lost along the way. We also found this beautiful aquamanel, well, the pieces of it. The one that still exists is in Germany, that's why we know how it looked. It was used for special ceremonies on the table. Next to it, we have ceramic items with glazing. At that specific time, meaning 14th century or the end of 13th century, glazing was still something that only was done in other countries. As a result, it was extremely expensive. Only later on, we'll bring the technology of it right back to us. Now, along the way, if you kind of continue on this path, which at that time actually would be the place of a wooden road, you can see these beautiful displays with a lot of information. Because we wanted to create the exhibition based on specific periods and rulers, obviously we provide a lot of information about them uh, as uh, characters, including maps showcasing how big the country was. This is the map of Lithuania at the third centu uh, 13th century end and the beginning of 14th. You can see at that time we're a tiny bit bigger compared to today. We are now going to the next area. While we are going, you should look to this side. You will notice we have the remains of the palace walls. If you look to the lowest part, you can still see boulders. And then on the top, we already have our brick castle walls. And obviously we have our current castle on the top. Now, as we move forward, you should take a look onto that side. Because we have beautiful displays showcasing different parts of our history, this specific one is quite important. If you look here, we have basically the end of 14th century. Yogaila, a Lithuanian duke, in 1385 will become king of Poland. And even though Yogaila himself at that time is not controlling Lithuania or Grand Duchy of Lithuania, it will have effect on us. You see, two years after his coronation, Lithuania finally gets baptized, and by that, technically, Crusaders should stop attacking us. But we all know, sadly, in 1410, we'll have another battle with them. Now, if we look at the items a bit to the side from the actual display, you will notice they don't look royal. That's because a lot of people look within the castle territories, or in this case, just beyond the castle walls. Most of these items are quite simple. However, all of them are around 600 years old, including little things like spoons, knives. And what is interesting, in this case, we have a plate that already has a mark showcasing who made that plate or who owned that plate. This specific display overall 
was made so it would kind of depict how a house would be. This would be the entrance into the house with the door, locks, and keys, the stepping part, then everything on the inside, and then everything that you find outside. Among more interesting pieces would be this specific shovel. Now when we think about shovels, we think about metal end and then the wooden part or obviously plastic at that time metal was available but it was quite pricey so instead they made a metal tip and put it on the wooden part instead we also have work gloves that are made of leather the same goes for the shoes now as time goes on early gothic castle changes the area is developing and now we have already early 15th century if you can, if you will look here, the place has changed a bit. The fortification has changed. If before we saw wooden fortifications, now we have pure uh, brick and the upper castle has already changed as well. Showcasing that the Vilnius is developing into a more kind of structured city. If we'll go right here, this is the map that all Lithuanians are proud to showcase, especially for foreign visitors. This is the beginning of 15th century. This is the time when Grand Duke Vitotas basically takes control. This is also the time when Lithuania reaches the biggest extent territory-wise throughout our history. We basically go from Baltic Sea to Black Sea to Moscow city borders. And even though this is important, it only will last a couple of years. However, Vitotas himself, here we can actually see him, um, was so good with politics, uh, military tactics, that he managed to make sure that local nobility and foreign powers would actually see him as potential king. There is a reason why Lithuania is called Grand Duchy or Duchy instead of Kingdom, because throughout our history we had only one king, Mindaugas. After that, the highest rank you could get was Grand Dukes. Vitotas, however, was so powerful that he manages to make sure to get the crown and he was supposed to be coronated right in this palace, or I should say castle. However, that never happens. Sadly, he falls from a horse and dies, and it just goes back into the history as remembrance of what could have been. Talking about more physical items, here we have all of the items that you would find at that time within the castle territory. Now, castle doesn't specifically mean there's military. A lot of traders would work in the castle territories. Like in this case, we have leather workers. Among the items, we can see the actual tools, like scissors. If you look at these scissors that are from the beginning of 15th century, you will notice they look almost exactly the same as they would look today. The same goes with a handbag. Even though I call it a handbag, realistically, at that time, it would be born, uh, worn attached to your belt. We also can see a little bowl that children could play with and a little pouch for coins. If we'll move to the middle, we have different jewelry items. That includes amber, obviously one of the most prominent resources that we had, and different jewelry pieces, including these beautiful earrings. However, uh, however what is interesting, we not only found the items, which at any point could be imported, but we actually found the tools used to make them. Meaning, instead of just importing, like I said, masters, we also imported resources and we're able to make all of this ourselves. We have smelting uh, forms, we have forms into which the metal would be poured, and we have half-made pieces, showcasing that the area itself had much, uh, quite fast developing technology. Here we have bone and horn. Bone and horn is once again one of the oldest resources we had. Among more interesting pieces, we have these chess pieces. Game of chess at that time was still considered a game of nobility. And the actual board of chess was supposed to represent the war field. Basically, it was a way for rulers to fight without starting a war. On the lower part, we have items connected to tailoring and making clothes that once again include simple items like scissors that look almost exactly the same as they would look today, needles and thimbles. Kind of showcasing that the basics of the technology hasn't changed that much. Now, let's move on to the next area. Here we have some of the newest additions to our collection, which is saddles. 
At that time, riding a horse was obviously very important. Cars were not existent. Based on the size of the saddle, you can actually see how big, or I should say, how small the rider was. However, however don't be uh, confused. It could be that this specific saddle was used by a child because if you look at these shoes, those are horse riding shoes. They probably belong to a child who was roughly around six years old. The spur is believed to have belonged to someone around three, year old, three years old, which kind of gives us information that childhood, the way we see it today, wasn't really there and everyone had to learn quite fast how to be adult. Now let's move on to our pride and joy, some of the stove tiles and more clay pieces. Early Gothic castle and late Gothic castle was already quite embellished. It had different coloring. We found a lot of floor tiles, wall tiles, and stove tiles. Among the stove tiles, we have very old symbols of our Vitis or towers of Gediminas, showcasing that even during Gothic periods, our rulers loved adding their symbols into the ensemble of the castle. Um, another interesting piece would be this, part of the rooftops. Now glazing, as I mentioned, was quite pricey. To get each of these colors, they had to smell different metals. The fact that the ruler chooses to invest money into this type of uh, embellishment showcases almost sending the symbol. This castle is important. This castle is worth the investment. Now, if we'll move on to this map, after Vitota's death, Yegelian dynasty takes over. Sadly, <laughs> Kazimir Yegelian, even though he's called sometimes father of kings, manages to lose part of the Lithuania, well, Grand Duchy of Lithuania. You can see we are a bit smaller. However, his sons will now control Poland, Czech Kingdom, Hungary, and Moldova as part of Poland. All of this becomes Eastern European Yegelian Empire, and technically, at least territory-wise, it was bigger than Grand Duchy of Lithuania at our biggest extent. And the last part on this specific floor would be items connected to hobbies. During excavations, we found the remains of this little bird, showcasing once again that hunting was extremely important to the nobility. Uh, the same, uh, next to it, we can see the actual uh, head, headgear of the actual bird that would be used before the actual hunt, if you look up. You can see how it would have looked on the bird. And this specific bird is believed to be chicken hawk, uh, probably a female chicken hawk that probably died because of a broken wing. On the lower part, we can see half of a tabletop game called Kvirkata. Sadly, the other half did not survive. And if you will have a chance and visit us, feel free to sit down with your little ones and play the game yourselves to see who is actually best at it. Now, the last piece that I want to show would be these stove tiles. These are a bit simpler compared to the ones that we'll see up ahead, but you will notice they are different sized. Based on the size of the stove tile, it had different function. Was, one was supposed to keep as much of heat as possible. Uh, the other one was supposed to get heated really fast, but release the heat as well. In that way, the palace, or in this case, still the castle, was able to be kept warm throughout any seasons. And the last stage of the castle, before it will be turned into the palace, the very end of basically 15th century, we now have residential building that is covering all of this area. You will notice cathedral has grown quite a lot and slowly but surely little buildings are popping, on, uh, popping up uh, along the way, creating almost the beginning for the Renaissance palace territory that we'll have a bit later on. And now I would like to invite you to the second floor of the first route, where we'll kind of enter into Renaissance, the time that we are trying to represent as the building and the time when true palace culture started living here. 
So since just a few moments ago we visited the first route, well, the beginning of the first route, now us being on the second floor gives us an advantage to see everything from above. You will notice the old spaces uh, clearly seen as well as the old stairs that would have led from the actual cellar level to the next uh, floor. In current times, you can see Vilnius City is much higher compared to the past. And what is interesting that today we don't have water here. However, at that time, groundwater levels quite often would rise to the point where all of this would at least be partially flooded. Now, if you would like to see all of this life being built and destroyed and being built again, you can actually, once visiting, see our 3D movies. It lasts around eight minutes and during that time you can actually experience the whole history in very neatly packed package. Uh, from me to this side you can see a lot of leather items including shoes, hats and so on that were lost along the way. Uh, if you look to the other side, you can see a lot of architectural pieces that were basically found within the territory and that later on helped us to rebuild part of the interiors that we'll see a bit later on. Now let's move on to the next part. That is quite interesting. Mostly these items would belong to everyday, um, I can't say person, but basically the servant because most of these items were found within the territory of the kitchen of the palace. However, if you look lower, even the flooring at that time is already glazed and quite colorful. Once again, showcasing the true Italian style. Inter interesting fact, when Bona's force arrives, she brings new cutlery item, a fork. First forks, at least the ones that are used in the kitchen, have only two needles. Later on, they will have three and more. Uh, before that, we only use spoons, knives, and our fingers, creating quite interesting experience. Now, as obviously the place is changing and true renaissance is coming our way, you can actually see the territory is changing as well. So at the very beginning of 16th century, the true royal palace of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania is established. We now have separate entrance, and interestingly enough, the palace and cathedral are connected, so the ruler, if you would want to, could go into the chapel and pray. Now, another interesting fact, if you look here, we can see a lot of new buildings established, some of them being coin-making places, some of them being treasuries, and we have another little church that sadly today no longer exists. Now, let's move on to our pride and glory, Renaissance stove tiles. So we do have one of the biggest collections of Renaissance stove tiles in Europe, definitely, definitely in Lithuania. And each of them is original. It obviously had to be restored because some of them were found in little pieces and had to be put back together. But for the most part, they are exactly as we found them. Uh, the reason why I say it was like a piece of art because to make one quite often it required at least three people to work on it. One would have to actually do the shape from clay, one would do the wooden stamp, and the other one would do the coloring. As a result, stoves were extremely expensive and depending on the color scheme, the actual price would go even higher. Because this is the time when Sigismundus the Old and Bona Sforza ruled the territory, like I said, it was blossoming, and uh, eventually they have son, Sigismundus Augustus. Sigismundus Augustus himself actually will change our history forever. He will sign Ljubljan Union in 1569, basically combining Lithuania and Poland into Commonwealth. As a result, quite often at the very top of the stove, you will notice a lot of coats of arms, not just our Vitis, but also the Polish ones as well. And talking about Lithuanian symbols, Vitis quite often was seen as important symbol and was put at the very top of the stove or on the eye level. Like in this case, lower a bit, we can have, we, we can see one, and two. Now, rulers' initials were also quite important. They had to tell a guest who is the ruling ruler is right now. In this case, at the very, very top, we have S A, 
Sigismondo Augustus, once will be in interiors, you will see the actual stove that has been reconstructed. And this is the actual original piece that we found during excavations. It's obviously a very beautiful piece of art and kind of reminds us about that part of our history. Now, with Sigismundus so Augustus uh, signing Lublin Union, it changed Lithuania's political situation. Uh, sadly, to us, we had to give half of our territories, but we kept our separate law. Sigismundus so Augustus also had three wives along the way. Elizabeth from Austria, from Habsburg family. The second wife was Barbora Radvilaita from Radvila family. And because the first wife died quite soon, the second wife died quite soon, he had to marry third time. He married the sister of his first wife, Elizabeth, in this case, Kotrina, but sadly, she did not provide him an heir. As a result, he divorced her and he died without having anyone to take the throne after. So not only he signs Lublin Union, making us smaller and now together with Poland, but he also pushes our territories into new era where we now have to elect our first rulers. Uh, the first, or I should say, the long-lasting first dynasty that will be elected will be Vasa dynasty, and first of that dynasty will be Sigismundus Vasa. Now, it may sound weird. Why Vasa dynasty? They are Swedish. Well, to be fair, they did have connection to our family. You see, Sigismundus Augustus had sister Catherine. Catherine was married to Jan Vasa, who later on became king of Sweden, and their son, Sigismundus, became king of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania. From the mother's side, he was Lithuanian, from the father's Swedish. As a result, Swedish Vasa, uh, Swedish Vasa dynasty will take control for quite a few years. However, eventually a lot of dynasties end, and you will notice a lot of dynasties were elected along the way, including Wettin dynasty, um, from Saxony, Augustus II, sometimes called the Strong, and Augustus III. Um, all of these people, even though controlled the area, very rarely actually lived here. Now, let's move on to the next part of the exhibition, where we'll see items connected to already Baroque period rather than Renaissance, and we'll see what Vasa dynasty managed to bring to us. With Vasa dynasty coming into this place, obviously the palace is changing. Vasa, like I said, was a Swedish dynasty that arrives here, changing Renaissance palace to the Baroque. Here we can actually see a display telling us a bit more information about the bringing of Sigismundus Vasa, the first from the Vasa dynasty, and about his overall rule. As I mentioned, their arrival changed quite a few things. We now have a bit darker colors and new things have been invented. For example, stove tiles that previously was very expensive and very difficult to make now can be mass produced. In this case, we have Baroque stove tiles. As you can see, the color has changed. Now we have blue and white. And even though they are mass produced, that doesn't mean they are cheap. However, they are no longer the same as they were previously done. But even Vasas knew that some people on some occasions have to have special items made just for that. And here we can actually see a few of them. One is very, very important. Sigismundus Augustus, as we'll talk a bit later on, managed to order some tapestries to showcase that the Grand Duke's crown within Grand Duchy of Lithuania was more important. In this case, we have one of the uh, stove tiles. We have, once again, coat of arms of Lithuania, coat of arms of Poland, Vasa dynasty symbol, and above we have Lithuanian Grand Duke's crown showcasing that this specific uh, stove tile was made for this residence to once again remind Lithuanians that this crown has almost 
the same amount of power as the Polish king's crown. Among other interesting soft tiles, we have few right here. These specific ones belong to Radzvilla family. Radzvilla family is one of the most prominent and most powerful families in Europe. They also managed to get a status of prince uh, from emperor of that time. So as a result, they were not only working in the highest political positions, but quite often you could say we're almost like working political field almost as non-seen rulers for quite some time. Now let's move on to the next area that will bring us to the time after the palace has been attacked. So after the attack that happened in the middle of 17th century, palace never fully recovered. Here we can see depictions uh, that were actually captured sadly at the very end of 18th century, showcasing the front of the palace crumbled, crumbled the upper castle being almost fully destroyed, and that hill that now has three crosses only having one. Uh, this is also the time when the palace will be given to city citizens. And though they were obviously quite quick to take their items once they had to leave, here we can actually see a few that were left behind. One in particular interesting would be this. Since hygiene at that time was poor, um, this item helped people to survive everyday life. And this is a flea catcher. It worked the same way as the simple catcher would. The top would be opened. Then into the middle, you would add a bit of animal blood and something that would be sticky enough to not allow anything to come away. Then you would put the flea catcher into your pocket and throughout the day, fleas would try to go inside through those little holes and would get trapped. The reason why this is interesting because later on hygiene standards will go up again, but at this specific time, fleas and other little insects were quite common, which only tells us that romantic past sometimes is not that romantic. Now, because this specific area that we're in is basically built in the place where Schlossbergers, the man who was responsible for doing the deconstruction of the palace in 19th century, built his house, we really wanted to showcase the original flooring of the first floor of the palace. Hence why we covered it with beautiful glass. As we will continue to the main part of the Schlossbergers house, you will notice that the actual flooring is going deeper and deeper, showcasing that the place itself had to survive through many periods. Now, if you look to this side, here we can see the same flooring, only not covered. And if you look a bit to the left from it, to that side, you will notice the wall looks quite damaged. Why? Well, because the palace walls were quite thick, sometimes even up to three meters thick, Schlossberg, as the man who built his house here, decides that it would cost too much to upkeep with the heating. So he basically orders himself or some of the workers to basically make the wall thinner and probably later on adds walkway to another room. Now, after this part, let's continue on to the next floor where we will see some of the uh, pictures that we're taking along the way of the research and we will actually go into historical interiors. Talking about Schlossberger's house and the area itself, here we can see the depiction how the Vilnius looked in 19th century. As we can see, the palace is already gone. Now we have Schlossberger's house with the territory next to it. You will also notice most of the buildings within the perimeter have been destroyed and now have, we have fortification being prepared. The only building that was basically untouched which was cathedral. And even though it wasn't allowed to use it for its its initial purposes, the building itself managed to survive. Now, slowly but surely, let's walk to the next floor where we'll start historical interiors. And along the way, I would like you to look at piece, uh, bits and pieces of the original Schlossberger's house that we've kind of kept intact. In this case, we have the actual stairway and a bit higher up, we'll see beautiful frescoes on the walls.
And here you can see the beautiful fresques on the walls that we managed to restore. If you look from certain angles, as you will visit the palace, you will notice the parts that are originals and the ones that were reconstructed. Now, as mentioned, let's go to the next floor. It is still continuation of archaeological part, but it's also the beginning of historical interiors. So the current palace couldn't start from nowhere. So obviously a lot of people worked many, many years. Here we can actually see some of the pictures from the earliest research that could be captured by camera. 1,988, you can still see people kind of doing most manual uh, labor um, at that time. We didn't have pumps, we didn't have a lot of technological items that we currently have. So first archeologists were really doing it from the bottom of their heart, wanting to really retrieve pieces of our past. And here you can actually still see the whole territory of the palace before the palace will appear here. And you can see Schlossberger's house. Now, if you look a bit lower, we can see already colored pictures showcasing already more advanced archeological research within the territory. This one specifically is from 2009. Actually, in that year, symbolically, the museum was established, but the palace itself opened its gates for public only in 2013. Talking about the museum, here we can actually see the uh, progress of work during the construction of the palace, starting in 2002, and then slowly, but surely going down, and in 2017, being almost fully done. Hence why, even though we opened gates in 2013, only actually a couple years ago, we now opened our gates to all of the interiors. And the last area in this specific route is dedicated to all of the people who donated to make this happen. Creating of the palace was one of the biggest projects that our country undertook. It cost us quite a few million and a lot of private, I can't say investors, but private donators put their coin in there as well. Here we can see the plank telling about who donated what amount. And what is interesting, a lot of these people will will also be displayed along the way on little golden on the planks with golden writing showing our respect. And on this side we can see different people that once again were responsible, obviously our President Brzozowskis and some of the researchers. For example, here we have our dendrochronologist to whom uh, we need to thank to be able to date most of our layers currently. And now Hopefully, you learned about the beginning. It may not be very flashy, but without that, nothing else could exist. And now, let's go into the route number two. So, officially welcome to the tour route number two. In this specific route, we'll see no longer archaeological items, but rather recreated interiors. And we'll actually learn how the palace looked and functioned when it was still here. Let's start with this specific area. Now, when you would arrive at the palace at that time, it wouldn't be that easy. You couldn't just go to the ruler, so it'd have to start somewhere. In this case, guard's room. Because we did have the remains from former councils, we did want it to showcase those specific areas as well. So the room that we're in, which is the guard room, is recreated in early Gothic style. Hence why, if you look up, we'll have a very beautiful ceilings with coat of arms of Lithuania in the middle. If you look down, you will notice very beautiful Gothic style flooring. Interesting fact, all of the items, meaning architectural items, were found during excavations, and this is the result. Now, let's imagine you're a guest. You arrived here, you left your weapons, and now someone will actually show you the way to the next room, where you would actually start waiting for the meeting with the ruler. Let's continue on. So you arrived into the waiting room or so or so called antechamber. The room itself is recreated in late Gothic style. If you will look up, you will notice the ceiling slightly changed. We have a bit more color and the area looks 
kind of bit different. Now, however, the main jewel of this specific area would be a very beautiful stove. If you will remember, in the first round, we actually saw the originals from the stove. In this case, we have a recreated version that includes pieces with coat of arms of Lithuania and some of the coat of arms of different noble families. Because this is a waiting room, of course, we have table with chairs. At that time, you would be seated either for a longer period of time on the bigger chair or shorter period of time by the little chair that is right there by the actual wall. Let's imagine you waited for a couple of hours. Finally, ruler is ready to meet you. Let's continue on to the lower throne room. Lower throne room is completely different area for the most part because not only we have changed the actual rooms, but we have changed the periods. This is Renaissance. We have true Italian court culture displayed everywhere around us. If you look down, you will notice the flooring is much more colorful. Each piece once again has been found through archaeological research. If you will look up, the ceiling is embellished with gold items showcasing the wealth of that time. Renaissance period is the time when the palace gets established. So for the most part, the main rulers would be Sigismundus the Old, Bona Sforza, and their son Sigismundus Augustus. Those are the people that you can actually see right now. We have Sigismundus the Old, the Grand Duke of Lithuania and King of Poland, Bona Sforza, his wife, Italian monarch that come from Milan and brought, like I said, true Italian court culture. Then, if you look right there, we can see Sigismundus Augustus, their son, the one that signed the union, creating commonwealth between Lithuania and Poland, his first wife, Elizabeth from Austria. We can see a very beautiful painting of her. And his third wife, Catherine, actually the sister of his first wife. Uh, sadly, none of his wives, nor Elizabeth, nor Barbara de Vlaita, who was actually his second wife, sadly we don't have the painting of her here, nor Catherine did not provide him with an heir. So as a result, after his death, for the first time in our history, we'll have to elect no rulers. But without talking about sad notes, let's actually look at the items that we can actually see here. In the corner, we have a very beautiful Renaissance stove. In this case, we have completely different colors, bright yellow, bright blue. We also can see different characteristics of different plants. If you look right there, we have one tapestry that we know 100% existed in this palace. Why? Well, it belonged to Sigismundus Augustus. When Sigismundus Augustus becomes Grand Duke of Lithuania and King of Poland, he orders probably a series of tapestries showcasing his devotion to the land. This specific one has a very distinctive piece, the crown of the Grand Duke of Lithuania above the coat of arms of Lithuania, Poland, and different uh, coats of arms that were important at that time. Why this is important? Most of the tapestries that you will notice during the tour, even though are originals, they were made in the same place that the tapestries would have been made at that time. However, we can only assume that it would have been here. This one, however, 100% was made for this residence. And now let's imagine that we are part of the administration. Let's move on to the next room. So let's imagine we're part of the administration. We're waiting for the same meeting with the ruler that everyone else is waiting, however, on the other side. And this would be the room that you would stop in. Now, this is also Renaissance. However, in this case, if you will look down, you will notice the flooring is not completely finished. And it's not, uh, not on purpose. Realistically, we knew that we will have more visitors per day than probably palace had sometimes per weeks, so we kept it simple. However, if you look to a little corner right there, just by the window, you will notice the color scheme is very similar that we saw just seconds ago. One and one of the most important centerpieces in this specific area would be this stove. First of all, it has very beautiful crown embellishments. If you'll notice, on each of them we have a symbol meaning S, Sigismundus the Old. He was the father of Sigismundus Augustus. 
What is interesting about these specific cells, you will notice there is no entrance in the actual room. The reason for it being, if you are part of the nobility sitting here with your beautiful clothing, you rarely want to have servants run around, bring muck from outside, or start huge fires. As a result, each stove is actually fed from the outside gallery that is also used for them to go from one part of the palace to another without interrupting any administration workers. Now let's assume you're part of the administration and you decide that you want to talk to a person who is almost second after the ruler, chancellor. So let's go into his work office. Because we're now talking about individual, we now have a bit more cozier area that in this case already has two paintings of two chancellors that were important to this country. One being Leona Sapiega. Among of the items that you can see around us that once again I want to mention are originals, however had to be bought and brought back, we have very interesting book. Lithuanian Third Statute. Lithuanian Third Statute was actually almost like the result of the deal that Leona Sapiega went with Polish nobility. So Leona Sapiega comes to Polish court and says, sure, we'll vote for the person that you want us to vote, but you have to make sure that our Third Statute is seen as actually functioning law book. What is interesting about this third statute, it specifically was almost two times bigger than the previous ones. It was actually not written, but actually printed, which was the first statute that was printed at that time, at least Lithuanian statute. And it actually was written in two languages, Ruthenian and Polish. Not uh, only that, this statute was so intricate and had so much information that even when Lithuania and Poland were basically separated and Lithuania destroyed, even Russian Tsar basically gave an order for the third statute to be translated, at least partially, into Russian so that his government could use, could use pieces for their own. Now, because we are in almost manieristic era, era, we can see that the stoves that once were showcased now also have friends, simple fireplaces. Now, because we're in the chancellor's office and the room after that would be ruler's office, obviously there has to be a buffer and the buffer would be scribers' room. At that time, scribers would be almost like secretaries. They would have to do the paperwork, they would have to write letters, translate stuff, and so the room is quite simple, practical, usable for every day. One very beautiful piece of art would be this tapestry. Even though it doesn't have any connection to specifically scribers, it does have a huge connection to some of the hobbies that nobility had. In this case, we have tapestry from Brussels showcasing a scene of hunt. If you look closely, you'll notice in the middle we have the party of hunters hunting. In the very back, we have ladies observing the whole thing. The reason why this is important, because at that time, hunt quite often wasn't really for food, but more to showcase your status. Even for a certain period of time, people were not allowed to hunt in the forest that belonged to Grand Duke in order to keep it only for certain people. At the very front, we have different animals. One of them seems out of place. This is giraffe. Now, usually giraffes can't be found in Europe. However, uh, we know for a fact that rulers would like to splurge on exotic animals, bring them and keep them in their gardens as basically pets. Sadly, most of them would not survive longer than a year and would die. Not because it would be hunted, but because weather specifically was not really for them. Behind me, we also have a very beautiful stove. Once again, we can see a crown, in this case without any symbols, and we can see little angels all over the place, kind of showcasing that different themes were incorporated into stoves at that time. Now, let's assume that ruler talked with us and he wants to have a private conversation in the office. So, let's continue on.
So, now we enter the ruler's personal office. When Vasa dynasty takes over, they obviously want to adapt the palace to their own needs. So the palace kind of undergoes the change. In this area, you can see pure Baroque style. The flooring has changed, the colors became a bit darker, the ceiling is obviously differently shaped. Because this is ruler's personal office, a lot of times he would have to do a lot of work. One of the most interesting furniture items would be this desk. It would be used to stand and write letters. This specific desk came from Italy, and what is interesting, it has over 81 different hand-carved figures, making it one of the most exquisite pieces of art. Now, another interesting piece of art would be the painting on the wall. Its brother is now currently housed in Louvre, is very similar, similar. This painting came from the early 17th century. It was painted by Leonello Spada, and it showcases the concert. Only a trained eye will notice that the painting has been changed from the 17th century to a certain period of time. Why? One extra character was added. If you look closely, you will notice a lot of people here actually have very similar color scheme. One, however, seems to be off. This man with the flute was added few, probably 100 years after, just because someone who owned this painting decided he likes flutes and wants them to be added. A simple solution to a simple problem. Now, because this office would be used by either Sigismundus Vasa or later on Vladislav Vasa, we actually have the painting of Vladislav Vasa hanging above the work table. Talking about this ruler specifically, he really loved his office. There are even letters that survived that he wrote to his wife talking about the fact that if he could spend all his days somewhere, it would be here. Why? Well, there's a very simple reason. Here, he can actually be alone, which is difficult at that time for a ruler. Second, through his windows that we can see on that side, he would see his beautiful gardens, and if he would wish to, by making a few steps, he could go to his private quarters or to the chapel in cathedral. Even though the gardens did not survive, we do have a very beautiful tapestry showcasing how they could have looked. Maybe this tapestry is not showcasing these gardens, but they're showcasing typical Italian Baroque gardens. The tapestry is from the early 17th century and actually came from Brussels. You will notice that gardens at that time were not just random. It wasn't just plants dumped to grow. Realistically, everything was very well planned. Not only that, you will notice in the middle we have very interesting two birds. Now we probably will recognize them and probably even eaten them, not once and not twice. At that time, however, they were very exotic. We have turkeys. Because turkeys at that time were completely new to Europe, once they arrived, they were not used as a food item, but rather as an exotic bird and was able to roam gardens the same as peacocks or swans. Only basically in 18th century, people learned how to keep them in Europe, and so slowly but surely, they took their place on a plate on our tables. Now, let's imagine ruler, ruler sat here, he did all of his job, he decides that he wants to go to pray. Let's continue to the area that at that time connected palace to cathedral, where ruler could go to his private chapel, because let's be realistic, ruler would never pray with everyone else. It was way too dangerous. So, if we'll take a slow step, we'll come into the area that showcases the place where the connection is, and that's how it would have looked. The palace and cathedral were connected through corridor like this. Sadly, when the palace was destroyed, the corridor was destroyed as well. This window that we can see right here, would be that window, and then the window right here showcases the former connection. Right now, we only have the mark on the cathedral wall showcasing where the connection existed. When the palace was reconstruction, the idea of recreating the connection existed, but later on it was decided better to showcase the authentic piece rather than create new one that probably can't be really used today. 
Now, because this is such a close area to ruler's office, this is also would be a guard room. This is where guards would sit and only would allow the ruler and his family members to pass through. Hence why, instead of having beautiful wooden doors, we have a metal gate to ensure ruler's protection. Now, we talked about the administrational offices. Let's take a quick break and go to the observation tower to see how Vilnius city looks from above. So as a break from the main exposition, we'll visit our observation tower. The plus of this tower, it's always warm here and always bright. Now, another very interesting thing is that sadly, this type of tower probably did not exist, but it was recreated, well, I should say, created for our visitors to be able to observe a very beautiful scenery of Vilnius Old Town. The first and obviously very important piece in the scenery would be the actual, well, I can't say palace, Tower of Gediminas, though technically it shouldn't be called like that. As we'll talk a bit later on, the real Gediminas Tower is a bit different place. So we should actually call it Upper Tower. Just a bit to another side from it, we have three crosses on the hill that we believe once had another castle that sadly was completely destroyed and now can only be traced through archaeological research. If we'll move even a bit further, we will actually see beautiful Palace Street. Now, the name Palace Street seems kinda on the point. When you think about the center of the city, where do you think streets lead? Now, we also have very beautiful street going around, where at the previous periods when the palace still existed, would have been a Vilnale River. Talking about the buildings that are obviously new, that has nothing to do with the original palace period, meaning 16th or 17th or 18th centuries, we have presidential building right there where our current president resides, right next to Vilnius University. Meaning all of the most important political buildings are in one neatly packed spot. If you will look around, you will notice most of the buildings on this side are either red bricked or have red rooftops. However, if you look to the opposite side, you will notice we have a very wide river, River Neris, and it almost symbolically separates the old town from the new developments, including skyscrapers and so on. So when you visit Vilnius, you can actually see not only the rooftops, but the fronts of the buildings, while also observe the new developments as well. Now, as we took a, quite, a quick break from the main part, let's continue on with the route number two continuation, which would be at that time official quarters. So we are now on the third floor of historical interiors and we managed to come into this beautiful Renaissance hall. Now, even though this is one big space and in current times is quite often used for concerts, cultural events, political meetings, in the past, sadly, this space like this did not exist. Instead, we would have had three different rooms. But because this area is so often used for our current country's needs, we did want to showcase respect and love to our Lithuanian people who were basically funders of this museum at that time. And so we created a very beautiful embellishments under the ceiling, showcasing different coats of arms of cities. Starting from Vilnius, Kaunas, Klaipeda, the biggest cities of Lithuania, then going based on the alphabet, and then based on specific regions on the opposite side. The reason why we wanted this to be done is so that any Lithuanian citizen, as he would come here, he would know he's part of this palace. And behind me, you can see a couple of paintings. In the very middle, we have Vitotas the Great. We already talked about Vitotas in archaeological part, but in this case, you can see him standing proudly as being one of the rulers who almost became a second Lithuanian king. Because this specific space is so often used for different events, sadly, the paintings are copies. However, one painting in current time is obviously not a copy, but actually part of our uh, one item exhibition. Let's move on to actually look at it a bit 
closer. As we're passing through, you will notice their separation on the ground and on the ceiling. Symbolically, it showcases where one room would end and another would begin. We believe, based on historical records, that all of this site would have been used by Buona Sforza. Here, you would arrive and leave your weapons. The second room that you enter, you would sit down and wait for the meeting, and probably at the very back, you would actually get to meet her and talk to her. Currently, like I said, we're keeping it as one fluent space, just so that we could use it for, once again, different cultural events. Because the palace at that time and in current times was a very important political building, obviously a lot of high-level visitors would arrive. In current times, that includes presidents, ministers, military. In those times would be grand dukes, kings, and so on. Here we have a very beautiful painting, as we believe painted by Tommaso della Bella, showcasing a very interesting moment in Lithuanian history. In 1611, Tsar of Moscow, Vasily Shuisky, swears an oath uh, of allegiance in the Parliament of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. This specific painting managed to survive in Ukraine and currently is given to us for a brief period of time to showcase to our people, to remind us about our beautiful past. Now, let's imagine we had conversation here with Bona Sforza, and she decides that she wants to have more private conversation. She would guide us to her private quarters. So, we talked with Bona Sforza in a more official setting. Let's now move on to a more private office of hers. Now, Bona Sforza, when she was young, was considered one of the most beautiful women in history. What is interesting, though, in Lithuanian history, she quite often comes into as this old, kind of angry woman. Hence why, if you look to this side, we can see one of her, the paintings of her that once again showcases her as an old woman looking quite strict and angry. However, don't be misled by this specific depiction. Obviously, when Bona was still young, and that's when the time she got married to Sigismundos the Old, she was definitely one of the most beautiful women in Italy. That was one of the reasons why Sigismundos the Old chose her rather than other women. Not only that, while uh, during the courtship period, Sigismundus the Old sent his representatives to Italy, once they would come back, they would rave about how good of a dancer she was, how fluent she was, and how very well educated she was. Now, if you look here in the middle, I would like to think this is better depiction of how she looked when she first arrives in Lithuania and Poland. Because this is her private office, obviously it also has different symbols connected to her and her family. Once again, we have very beautiful stove. In this case, it has very specific symbol in the very, very middle. This is Sforza symbol, uh, family coat of arms. What is interesting about the stove, not only it yells Italy, the bright colors, the summer, but also it has a very interesting row of stove tiles. If you look to the lowest part, you will notice we have a scene that usually can't be seen in everyday life. Instead of having hunters hunting rabbits, it's other way around. Well, we believe that at that time there was a legend and a story about this specific uh, scenery, but it could have been intentional. You see, at that time, on the woman's side of the palace, usually children also would be educated. And when you look at the stove, you will notice this is the actual row that would be in the child's eyes at early age. Because hunting was so important at that time, we believe it could have been Bona was trying to send a message to Sigismundus Augustus, telling that even though you're the hunter, if you will behave badly, everything can turn around. Now, obviously, this is not a fact, but it could have been that way. Now, let's move on to her private bedroom. At that time, rulers usually had separate bedrooms. One bedroom for the wife, in this case, Grand Duchess and Queen of Poland, and 
the king and Grand Duke of Lithuania would be on the opposite side. Instantly, you will notice the flooring has changed. Where there we had more of a marble flooring, here we have wood, creating more cozy and private environment. In the very middle, we have recreated bed of Bona Sforza. What is interesting, for the most part, at that time, beds would look very similar to sofas. In this case, we have fully fledged bed that also have coverings allowing to give ruler's wife a bit of privacy. Another interesting piece of art is this little stand. Now, today, you wouldn't really know what it is, but actually, this would be the sink. At that time, in the very, very middle, would have a candle, and on the top, there would be a bowl with water, so the ruler's wife could actually clean herself before sleep. And what bedroom without a place where they could kneel and pray to God in the evening or in the morning. So, now that we visited the private quarters of the wife, let's assume that you're very high-level visitor arriving into the palace. So, let's go back into the Renaissance Hall and we will continue through antechambers to the upper throne room. So, let's imagine you're a king that just arrived into this palace. Obviously, you wouldn't once again go straight into the throne room. You would have to pass through three antechambers. The first one is currently war-themed. Now, here, your servants and some of your guards would have to leave their weapons. So, let's imagine I'm a sermon meister. I want you to feel comfortable, but I also want to observe you to make sure that you are not bad-mouthing the ruler. So, here I would greet you and I would actually escort you to the next area. Now, in current times, we have cameras, we have obviously phones, we can take pictures to remember everyday moments. At that time, however, that was not available. So instead, quite often, palaces would have galleries of paintings where portraits of former guests would be displayed. Because we obviously are a museum, we don't have that many paintings currently. However, at those times, every space that you can see around me would be filled with paintings of former guests. Now, without hesitation, as your portrait would be given to a representative, you would be once again escorted to the third antechamber. At that time, third antechamber would be the most prestigious place, because that would be the place where only kings and the highest ranking guests would be able to reside until they would be able to meet with the ruler. Now, if you will notice, on the left side we have a lot of chairs. That's because in current times and in those times, this area could also be used for concerts. Interesting fact, palace sadly never lived long enough to have a separate space built for operas, even though we did have three of them built within this uh, territory. And at that time, you would be sat down and you would wait for the meeting. In current times, you can see one of the most beautiful stoves that we have in the whole palace. It's also the biggest stove in our collection, right there in the corner. Probably the most important piece that you can see on this specific stove would be the very top. It has initials S.A. Sigismundus Augustus. As you might remember, once we visited the archaeological part, I showed you its original. And if you will look up, you will notice there are beautiful embellishments under the ceiling showcasing that a lot of noble families kind of work together to make sure that Grand Duchy of Lithuania is functioning properly. By the walls, you can actually see some of the chests, sometimes called cassins. Uh, they actually at that time could be used for two purposes. One, obviously to sit on them, and second, they would be basically like a baggage. So you could put a lot of items as you move one from one place to another. Our rulers weren't really residing in one place all their lives, so every few years they would move, take a lot of pieces of art with them. That's one of the reasons why Hegelians preferred tapestries over paintings because it was much easier to turn, kind of take them from one residence to another. 
Now, you waited long enough, and once again, you're very important guests, so let's continue on to the throne room, where we will meet the ruler. Well, technically, we should meet the ruler. You will notice the feeling of the area has changed completely. We also passed from Renaissance to Baroque. Once again, darker colors, a bit different space as well. In the very, very middle, we have a throne, above which we can see coat of arms of Lithuania, Poland, Sweden, and Vasa dynasty. All of it is being surrounded by the Order of Golden Fleece or Order of Golden Lamp. And at the very, very top, we have Polish King's Crown. Once this specific order, the Golden Fleece Order, would be given to someone, it was seen as highly, highly valuable item. Why? This order was only given by Habsburg family only to those who have reached the peak in their political career and have served Christian church. Other thing about that specific order is that once the person would die who received it, the order had to be sent back to Habsburg family and they would decide whether the next in line will receive it it once again. We know for a fact at least two dynasties that ruled Lithuania received this order. And at the very top, once again, we can see two beautiful coats of arms of Lithuania with Grand Duke's crown above it, Vasa dynasty symbol, and Polish coat of arms with Polish king's crown. Even after the Ljubljana Union, both crowns were seen as equals and quite often depicted in pieces of art, specifically on Lithuanian side. Talking about coats of arms, I would like you to look at this beautiful fireplace. Now, this is one of the pieces of architecture that we managed to find, maybe fragmented, but we managed to find through archaeological research. And based on the information we collected from Europe, we're able to rebuild very, very beautiful piece of coat of arms. Once again, we have Vasa dynasty symbol, king's crown, and order of golden fleece showcasing that Vasa dynasty really saw that order as something of importance. And actually, talking about the newest additions to our collection, we have two beautiful candlesticks from Tuscany that came from 16th century. They were in quite poor condition, but after long reconstruction, or I should say restoration, they're now back in shape and are basically making sure that if the Grand Duke would be sitting in the middle, he would have all the light on him. Another piece of interior that is, should be noted would be the ceiling. So if in Renaissance we had these beautiful squares, here we have completely different shape. This is also the only place in the whole palace where we have actual gold plating rather than just uh, gold on top of the wood. As a result, this makes this place even more special. Now let's imagine you are maybe another king, but you are a close friend of our ruler, and he wants to talk to you in private. You see, this area that we're in wouldn't really be used just for you and him. It actually would be also used for other noble family representatives. So in that case, he would ask you to join him in his private French salon. That is called French because all of the items that you can see here are actually from France. Here we have table with chairs, where obviously rulers could sit and talk, and we have beautiful tapestry that once again came from France. Interestingly enough, even in current times, this specific room is sometimes used by high-level representatives to talk in private. Obviously, this furniture is not used for those occasions. Now, we visited the ruler, Let's imagine we're actually part of his family. So we would gain access to one specific room, that is library. Welcome to the private library of the ruler. So what is interesting is that Sigismundus the Old and Bona Sforza really loved collecting books, and their son Sigismundus Augustus continued that tradition. It's believed that by the end of his life, he had at least over 4,000 books. 
a lot of them actually are now held in Vilnius University. Our current library sadly doesn't have that many, however most of them would depict the themes that would be present at that time. If we look to the left, we will notice a huge collection of books that came from different countries. Most of them are either connected to war. In this case, at the very top, we can see the barracks or, how the, way, or the way how to situate them. Then, if we'll go a bit further, we'll notice some books connected to history, chronologically, and obviously, about learning how to read and write. Now today it may sound funny, 4,000 books may not be that big of a collection. However, at that time, one book could cost more than seven horses. As a result, it obviously was someone's pride and joy. One of more interesting books, at least for me personally, would be right here. If you will come closer, you will notice this book in detail depicts the weaponry that was present. It actually is called Grand Art of Artillery. You can notice there's actual weapons and fortifications showcasing how to defend yourself against the attacks with those said weapons. Another piece that is worth mentioning would be the furniture, and in this case, this table. Even though the table is new, it was recreated based on the paintings, it does have coat of arms that we've seen not that long ago in the main throne room. Once again, we have coat of arms of Lithuania, only in this case we have it in more color. Coat of arms of Poland, coat of arms of Sweden, and Vasa dynasty symbol. Once again, all of it is surrounded by the Order of Golden Fleece or the Golden Lamp, hence why the little lamp right there, and we have a king's crown. It's a very beautiful centerpiece, kind of showcasing that even in those times, quite often they would try to make sure that their rooms uh, are full of symbols of the dynasties that were in control at that time. And in this case, we also have uh, globes probably depicting that at that time Europe already were trying to travel further and further and learn more about the world. Now, our collection also has some of little depictions of how rulers could have looked. I'm doing this because none of these depictions are actually from the time when the rulers lived. It's more of interpretation of people of the past, how people even long before looked. In this case, we have Vitotas and, well, depiction how he could have looked realistically. Once again, definitely that's not it. Now, let's imagine you're the actual Grand Duke and sitting here means you're surrounded by your family, so you might want to have some privacy. Let's continue on to the ruler's private reading room where he would enjoy peace and quiet while also looking at his beautiful environment and a fireplace. Sometimes we also call this room a Holland room. The reason why? If you'll notice, there is very beautiful pieces of marble. During excavations, we found a lot of pieces like this. After research, we learned usually they would be found in Holland. So we tried to reconstruct at least one fireplace and some of the uh, embellishments around the door. Because this is a private reading room, it's not really packed and once again suitable for one person to enjoy his time. If you look on that side, you will notice a very beautiful tapestry. It's believed it came from the set, um, basically correlating to landscapes with animals. However, this one has a mythical animal, dragon eating eggs. Even though the actual tapestry was in quite poor condition, but because we have a very good professionals in Lithuania, we, were managed, uh, we managed to restore it, and it's now very beautiful fitting into this room. Now, rural, ruler had full day of work, he wants to finally rest, so let's go to his private quarters. So welcome to the private quarters of the ruler. A very few people would have been able to visit this place. You will notice the color scheme, the flooring, the ceiling showcases that this is Baroque period, meaning this is the time when Vasa dynasty would be in control. The room that we're in would be the first kind of unofficial office room where ruler could sit down and lie down after a long day of work. After that, he would be able to continue to the room where he would change his clothes, 
or maybe get ready for sleep or other way around in the morning get ready for a long day interesting piece of art in this case we have a chair uh, actually would been probably would have been a barber's chair now we know that at that time the tradition of wearing wigs became quite prominent as we can see from this beautiful painting so quite often when ruler would have to start his day he would have to choose the wig for that day depending on the ceremonies that he would have to take part in and once again here he would have probably people attending to him you will also notice that once again private quarters have wooden floors that's because here he could actually relax instead of being in this kind of high position of having to be always prompted to talk or act in a certain way now let's imagine you are the grand duke you have changed your clothes and you're ready for the bed let's continue to the ruler's bedroom so the ruler's bedroom one of the most coveted places always surrounded by different secrets and legends however as you will notice it's quite a simple room we have a big bed for that time it was extremely big bed once again having the coverings that would allow some privacy and even though the bed is obviously reconstructed, it can still give us idea how the ruler would have lived. Another interesting fact, if you look at the top, we have this almost like second ceiling. That's because at that time, quite often, there would be a lot of different crawling crawlies on the ceiling and it would stop dropping during the night. So ruler was protected even more. And once again, what bedroom without place to pray? in front of the painting of Jesus Christ. And the other one, a bit smaller, is in front of Saint Mary, uh, or I should say Saint Family. Now, after we visited all of the official rooms, all of the administrational rooms, all of the rooms where the highest ranking members would meet, and of course the private quarters, we'll go to the last room in this tour route, which is the treasury. So welcome to the treasury. At that time, this would be one of the most well-protected rooms in the palace. In current times, sadly, it's a bit smaller than it would have been in the past. However, it still has quite a few items that obviously draw your attention. Here we have the whole row of crowns. The first one being Grand Duke's crown. Sadly, the original was destroyed and this is the reconstructed version that only lets us to see how it could have looked if it would have survived. Next three crowns are actual copies of copies. However, the originals were actually found in the burial places on the cathedral, in cathedral catacombs. Hence why we know for a fact that's how they looked. The first one, it is right in front of us, belonged to Elizabeth from Habsburg family. She was the first wife of Sigismundus Augustus. The second one, the second one preclo belonged to Barbara Radzilla, who was the second wife of Sigismundus Augustus. And the third crown actually predates basically the palace and it would have belonged to Alexander, the great Grand Duke of Lithuania and obviously the King of Poland that controlled this area before, well, before Sigismundus the Old. Now, even though the originals did not survive, we do have one item that came from the grave that initially was accompanied by the original of this crown. And this is Alexander's sword. Sure, it may not look pretty and it may not be in a great condition. However, it is original item that we know for a fact belong to our Grand Duke. Not only that, we have pictures that were made just after the actual graves were opened and here we can actually see the sword and the crown on the same spot. Because this is the treasury, obviously at that time it would contain a lot of jewelry items, pieces of art, uh, and of course some of the items that could then be brought onto the table. Let's start with the items that are definitely from here, are authentic and has been found through archaeological research. Most of them would be different jewelry pieces that have different rings, pendants. Most of the items probably were lost due to just kind of getting 
scratch or just basically disattaching from the clothing. Here we actually have a few of the rings that have symbols giving us information that they could have been also used as stamps. And here we have actually a pair of earrings that were found in the toilets. Now, talking of the treasury itself, this would be the place that you can look at and see the small scale representation. Um, different goblets from silver, gold, or bronze, clocks that at that time were still quite new and pricey. On the left side, we have glass items from which the oldest and actually from this place would be the glass goblet that belonged to Alexander's period. What is interesting, we found during excavations quite a few pieces and then after a few years of restoration they were put back together and now we have this beautiful piece with gold embellishments. In the middle we have glass pieces from 18th century. This is the time when Augustus II, sometimes called uh, Augustus the Strong, ruled Lithuania and also Saxony. Hence why, if you look in the middle, once again we have coat of arms of Lithuania, Poland and Saxony uh, to kind of showcase his family's correlation and the fact that this is the family now in control. Even though now the treasury is quite small, we know that during Renaissance period it was truly flourishing. Uh, there was a visitor, representative of the Pope, that was able to actually visit the treasury. He will write back to the Pope telling that the treasury itself was amazing and so big it almost reached Pope's treasury. Now whether it's true or not, it's very difficult to say, but depending on the territory that the Grand Duchy of Lithuania ruled at that time, the power that existed, Vilnius being the capital and the palace being important residence, we can actually at least think that the treasury itself was astonishing. And on this note, the second route would be officially finished and hopefully see you on the third one. So welcome to the route number three. This route, differently than the first or the second one, actually has three different themes. One would be the armory that we'll see a bit later on. Second one would be everyday life plus kitchen. And the third one would be music. However, I'm starting this right here for a very good reason. Right now, physically, we are in the middle of a true Gediminas Tower. As I mentioned before, the upper tower that is quite often called Gediminas Tower, is actually the upper castle tower. When Gediminas comes here, he builds early uh, brick castles, specifically in this area. And so quite soon we have this beautiful tower on this spot. So besides the ruins, we also have weaponry. Some of the items in our collection have been found uh, during research, as you can see all of them on this side. That includes parts of the armor, the actual weapons, uh, some of the items that would have been used even for children, for example, the stock of the archer's bow. Um, now, some of the items would be more intricate, like leather items, or items for a bit later period. What is interesting that our military had to fight on two fronts, east and west, crusaders and Moscow army. As a result, a lot of their weaponry was developed to be able to handle both sides. Like I mentioned, a lot of items sadly we couldn't find, so we had to purchase. As a result, the other side of the same exhibition showcases the items that would have been found at that time, but sadly had to come to us through other means in current times, including bigger ones or smaller items for personal use or for guard duty. Now, besides the actual weapons used in war or battles, we have quite a few items connected to hunting. Hunting at that time specifically was not only something that you would do to acquire food, but also symbol of status, as we talked previously. And we can have, uh, hopefully, take a look at some of the items that were found and purchased once again to showcase brief pieces from the actual hunting. 
you will notice these specific weapons already use little bullets rather uh, the actual arrows now as we'll take step further We'll walk past through the armor sets of that time. Uh, these armor sets are more full, so obviously they were purchased. Most of the armors would be purchased either from Germany or Italy. And so most of these armors wouldn't be used by a simple soldier, but rather of someone who was either hired or is higher up in command. Some, sadly, are only half of the actual set. Some look almost full. Now let's go to the second part or second theme of this specific route, meaning everyday life and kitchen. So this area best represents the second theme, meaning everyday life and kitchen. The area that we're in supposedly was actually the place of the kitchen. We know the kitchen had two separate spaces. Um, and what is interesting, this kitchen already had plumbing. If we look to this side, you can actually see the actual hill and the pathway that would lead into a collector that would allow sewage uh, to kind of leave palace's territory. Now, when I say leave, probably that means it would end up in River Vilala. Now, is it clean? Not really, but for that time, that was amazing. Kitchen itself, like I said, had two separate spaces, the clean kitchen and the dirty one. The dirty one meant that's where the meat, fish, and everything along those lines would be made, while the clean one would be used for baked goods, vegetables, and fruit. Here we can actually see depiction how the kitchens would have looked. Interestingly enough, you will notice they have open, flat, uh, open plan furnace with a beautiful thing on top that would allow smoke to leave the kitchen without making the whole kitchen full of smoke and not uh, usable. Because we did a lot of research, we managed to find quite a few items that would be found in the kitchen. Sadly, as you will notice, there's no silver or gold, mostly because sadly those items left our lands with all of the plundering of the enemies. However, among more interesting pieces, we have once again forks that quite often would be used in kitchens at that time, and a lot of ceramic items that usually would be used to store um, different uh, grains. Now, anyone who is very interested in this topic, as you would visit the palace, you would be able to look onto these displays that would give you even more information about the traditions of that time and what specific items were eaten during those periods. And of course, we obviously have themed um, excursions where we talk specifically about that topic. Now let's go to the third team, meaning music, where we will see what we have there. So this area best represents the music theme. And interestingly enough, we already know that in 14th century there were musicians present in the castle. However, we can't really talk about true art per se, until the Renaissance comes around and later on until obviously Vasa dynasty comes here. Uh, we can be very proud as a country. The first opera that happened here was the kidnapping of Elena. It happened 10 years earlier than it happened in London or Paris, uh, meaning one of the Vasa dynasty members visited Italy. He saw that opera just being made. He really enjoyed it. He came back and obviously ordered it to be done. The music was provided by Marco Scacchi. However, uh, even though we have quite a lot of information about uh, music of the past and different periods of music, we only have few items from that time. Few of those we can see right here. We have stove tiles showcasing different musicians. We have few sets of notes and we have one flute. This specific flute came from the end of 14th century, beginning of 15th century, and sadly is one of very few musical instruments that we can still see, uh, which only tells us that musicians tend to keep their musical instruments intact. This area is also a great space to showcase the connection between the past and the future. You see above us, there's a huge hall where we now have concerts, operas being made, and so on. The reason why it's important, because the original palace sadly did not have that space, but the new palace, the reconstructed palace, has it to once again show respect for the original one, but to continue on our own path. Now let's go to the second floor to actually visit the area that I just mentioned. 
So because the first opera in the palace happened in 1636, it was a kidnapping of Elena that, as I mentioned before, Vaza, uh, Vladislav Vaza brought from Italy. When this specific concert hall was opened, the first thing that we actually produced here was exactly the same opera. It happened in 2018, and now this specific area can house almost 400 visitors and viewers, hence combining the past of the palace with current times with our special twist. Thank you for joining us on our virtual tour. Hopefully you enjoyed your time and next time we'll be waiting for you in real life in a National Museum Palace of the Grand Dukes of Lithuania and of course in our beautiful city, Vilnius.